Jeffrey L. Schatzer is a national award-winning author of picture books and historical fiction chapter books for young people. His fanciful writing style and quirky characters make reading a joyful experience. Mr. Schatzer's latest in a series of Michigan history books for children is Professor Tuesday's Awesome Adventures in History, Book 3, The Underground Railroad. The first two books, entitled Chief Pontiac's War and Migrating to Michigan, the lead characters to all the books is a curious Professor Tuesday. His fanciful writing style and quirky characters make reading a joyful experience. My name is Jeffrey Schatzer and I write books for young people, historical fiction chapter books as well as picture books. And uh, I'm not going to read you one of my books today, I'm going to tell you about something that I feel very badly about. I was wrong. In the fifth grade, my teacher, Mr. Worth, he told me to write a paper on the person I would love to spend a day with. And have you ever done that? No? It's a really interesting exercise because it forces you to, to examine people. And so I read about a lot of famous people, and I came upon the person that I eventually wrote my paper about. And that was Albert Einstein. I like smart people. I think we're attracted to smart people. In class, you know, we know who the smartest person, you're probably the smartest person, aren't you? Yeah. In class, we're attracted to the smartest person, and we're interested in, in how their minds work differently than ours. And Einstein, he was an amazing intellect, although in some areas he wasn't very smart. He wasn't a very good husband. He wasn't a very good father. Uh, he wasn't always good at algebra. He was good at physics. So... What I found most interesting is not about his scientific accomplishment, which was undeniable. What he contributed to science was immeasurable in today's terms. But what I really was fascinated by him was his sense of humor. One of the things he liked to do is ride a bicycle in front of a camera. And he wouldn't just ride a bicycle. He would ride it around in big looping curves that made it look like he was falling off the Earth's surface. And people would laugh and he'd smile and he would just have a good time. And here you have one of the smartest men in the history of the world, smartest people in the history of the world, and yet he likes to show off and play in front of people. But that's just the beginning of it. He liked to dress up in funny clothes from time to time. Here he is wearing Fuzzy slippers. Now tell me, look at his face. He is enjoying that moment, isn't he? See, his sense of humor was really kind of wild. Here we have people imagining, walking up and saying, here is the great Dr. Einstein. Oh, and he might do something to goof on him. I like that kind of person, because it reminds me of me. But my favorite picture of Einstein is this one. Now, what does that picture tell you? Does that say the most brilliant person in the world? Or does that say, here's a man who likes to have a good time? Yeah, he had a good time, but he did, did so mostly in his own mind. And so I continue to read about historical figures and continue to admire intelligent people. And I'm going to tell you a story of an intelligent person I ran into in a history book, I wish I'd have met him and spent a day with him. And if I could possibly change the paper that I turned into Mr. Worth, I'd like to spend my day with George D. Baptiste. Now George, people called him George. George grew up in Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1815, almost 200 years ago. And George 
pretty average guy, went to school as a kid, spent a few grades in school, because back in those days you didn't get a high school diploma or a college, typically didn't get a college diploma. Uh, you might have gone to school long enough to learn to read, write, and uh, do a, some simple mathematics, addition and subtraction. Well, <clears throat> in his teenage years, he decided that what he was going to do was to become a barber. And so George apprenticed at a barber shop. Now, back in those days, uh, they didn't have the Fredericksburg Barber Academy. If you wanted to become a barber, you went and worked with a barber. Same thing, by the way, if you were a physician. Not many medical schools existed in the early 1800s. I think the University of Michigan's medical school didn't graduate anybody until 1859. So, or didn't even begin then. Anyway, um, George wanted to apprentice to become a barber, but something about him was unique. And I suspect it was his intellect and his sense of humor. After he got out of his apprenticeship at the barber shop, he took up with a man who traveled the South. Um, some accounts say that this man was a gambler. Some accounts say he was a riverboat gambler, which makes sense because that's how people traveled in those days, if you'll recall. And so if we think back to some of the old movies we've seen with the big paddle wheel ships going up and down rivers and the piano going and the smoke filled room and the guys playing poker. There were professionals who ran that circuit just like they run the, uh, uh, the Texas Hold'em circuits out in Vegas and around the country so we watch on TV today. Uh, but it wasn't a televised sport back then because obviously they didn't have television. But <clears throat> he traveled with this man. Now to travel in the south Oh, uh, well, there's one thing I didn't tell you about George. He was black. He was a free black man. And so he took up with his gambler and traveled through the South. Now, as he traveled through the South, I'm certain, even though the accounts don't tell me this, but I'm certain he had some interesting encounters with how people of his own race were treated differently than how he was treated. Because he wasn't enslaved, he was hired. And there's a world of difference between those two. So George traveled with this riverboat gambler, and I think he got a taste of how bitter slavery was. And after a time with the gambler, he started his own business in Madison, Indiana, the barbershop. And from almost day one in Madison, he was helping people escape across the Ohio River and north to freedom. Now, in the early days of George D. Baptiste's time in Madison, Indiana, he, would, he figured that if he could get people 12 miles north of the river, the Ohio River, they were safe. Well, that didn't last forever, but it lasted a while. And <clears throat> George would cut hair and give shaves all day long, and at night, he would sit on the bank of the Ohio River with a lantern, sometimes in the rain just waiting for people to see that light cross the river and intersect with him so he could help them on to freedom. Well, it didn't take long. It wasn't a small world back then. You know, it, wasn't, it was even smaller then than it is now, let's say. And what happened was that people began to wonder if, if this black barber was helping slaves across the border. Well, somebody confronted him one day. A slaveholder from Kentucky and said, George, are you helping slaves across the border? Are you helping them across the line into freedom? That's not right. That's against the law, you know. And George, showing how smart he was, he didn't say yes, because that's exactly what he was doing. But if he said yes, he would have been thrown in jail or worse. He didn't say no, because that would be a lie. So he told him the truth. And what he said was this. If I were smart enough to help slaves escape to the north, there wouldn't be any slaves in Kentucky. You see, what he did is used his wit and his intellect. He joked with these people, but they didn't understand it. Because back then, if you were black, most whites, especially slaveholders, thought, 
that you didn't have a brain in your head. You were little more than cattle that needed to be prodded and poked and beaten to get into position and do all these things that you wanted to have done. And so they couldn't imagine that, that a black person was actually intelligent. So when he said, well, if I were intelligent enough to do that, there wouldn't be any slaves in Kentucky, they all thought, well, I suppose he's right, and they left him alone. But it wasn't long after that, one of his regular customers decided that he was going to try to pull a fast one, try to catch George D. Baptiste in the act. So as I read his obituary in the Detroit newspaper, come on in. As I read his obituary in the Detroit newspaper, it said, <clears throat> at one point in time, George D. Baptiste, uh, a slave, came to his door, but he suspected that the slave was not telling the truth. The slave knocked on his door one night and said, uh, George, uh, I want to run away and can, can you show me which way to, to go to, to find freedom in the north? And George, according to the, according to the obituary, said, oh no, no, I, I, I don't do that type of thing. And then what happened a few days later is that he's giving a shave to the man who owned the slave that showed up at his door. And it said in the obituary that Mr. George D. Baptiste won a hat in a bet with the slaveholder because he said to the slaveholder, you know, one of your slaves came to see me the other night and wanted to go escape on the Underground Railroad. And I told him I didn't know anything about it, but I have a feeling that that guy's going to run away. And the slaveholder said, oh, George. You don't know what you're talking about. He's loyal. He's got the greatest job in the world. I don't hardly beat him at all. Why? He has no reason to leave me. And George says, well, let's make a bet. Well, I suspect that George's part of the bet was some free shaves. But George wanted something different. If he won the bet, that guy came in with a really cool hat, and George wanted his hat. So sure enough, within the next few weeks, the slave ran away. George got the hat. That's what the obituary tells us. But I think here's how it played out. If I were owned by somebody and I were a slave, I wouldn't like it, would you? No, not fun. And if my master said, you go to this guy and you find out if he's working the Underground Railroad, tell him you want to escape. And then you come back here and tell me what he says, and then we'll arrest him. Right. Here's what I think happened. The guy beat on his door. George answered it. Yeah? The guy says, guess what? You're not going to believe this. My master, <laughs> my master wants me to find out from you if you're helping people on the Underground Railroad. And I'm, when I come back, I'm going to tell him, yes, yes, he is. He's going to come and arrest you. And George laughs. Come on in. Come on in. Have some dinner. Can I get you something to drink? I bet you that's exactly what happened. He knew from the minute that guy knocked on the door that this guy was not really interested in making George, uh, exposing George's Underground Railroad habits or interests. He wanted to be a part of it. And so that's why George made the bet in the barbershop and got himself a new hat. So. George hung out in Madison, Indiana for a number of years, and uh, <laughs> it got a little hot for him because people realized he was helping a lot of slaves escape across the Ohio River and north into Ohio and Indiana and Michigan and on into Canada to, to find freedom. <clears throat> but a bounty was put on his head for $1,000. $1,000 doesn't seem much today, but back then, it was a lot of money. Probably somewhere in the vicinity of 25 times 1,000, so it's maybe $25,000 in today's value. But he decided he had to do something else or he was going to get eliminated. 